So I'd first like to thank Professor Ogawa and the organizing committee for inviting me here. Uh, it forced me to leave Canada because I was wondering whether I'd ever leave Canada. So it's really good uh, that I got here. Also, I'd like to thank um, the graduate students who did all the work, and they're all either profs or doing postdoctoral fellowships somewhere. So obviously, I wouldn't be able to do the work without them. Um, so the, the other thing I should mention is that uh, I ha I'm, I, I'm assuming everybody knows what cold spray is. So I haven't put anything uh, to describe in any detail what cold spray is, but it's kind of a simple technique where it's powder consolidation by accelerating powders at high velocities, whereupon when they hit a substrate, they should stick. And the key to all of this is that you need plastic deformation. This is the Wong building. It's in Montreal. This is in McGill University. That's where I work. Uh, but the cold spray facility isn't there uh, because McGill can't accept powder things. It's a bit risky. And so the uh, facility is actually um, a, a collaboration with uh, the National Research Council of Canada um, and it's uh, in uh, their facility in Boucherville, which is something like 20 to 30 kilometers away from McGill, so it's quite accessible. And uh, the, the coal spray facility is that, in that end of the building. In fact, the, the, the facility is kind of dedicated to thermal spray and a couple of other things. So coal spray is kind of like an addition to thermal spray. And this is the booth that we've or that we've got currently. Uh, it's been there since 2007, but we're getting a second booth because we got more money from the government to expand the facility to uh, additive manufacturing. Uh, so um, the problem uh, that we encountered with cold spraying uh, CFRP is we think the fact that um, it's an epoxy resin uh, that's holding together uh, the uh, pot, the CFRP. And so uh, if we look at th this very simple graph of deposition efficiency, which is how much the powder sticks versus velocity. Uh, for ductile materials, uh, there's a critical velocity. So here is uh, deposition efficiency. This is velocity. And so at some velocity, the powder starts sticking. And then shortly, at slightly higher velocities, uh, the um, uh, deposition efficiency increases rapidly. And then at some point, uh, deposition efficiency starts decreasing, and we think this is something to do with erosion. So uh, erosion does two things. It makes uh, uh, the coating difficult to stick, and also you lose material, and eventually um, uh, the erosion takes over and you don't get any deposition, and so that's it. But uh, there's a lot of uh, capability of um, uh, coating because usually the erosion velocity is a lot higher than the critical velocity. And personally, I've never seen or I've never personally experienced an erosion velocity in the ductile materials that I've been looking at. Brittle materials are different, especially if the brittle material is especially brittle and uh, it doesn't take much velocity for erosion to take place. And in that case, basically, you never get deposition, you just keep getting erosion. And that will seem to be the problem when we try to cold spray a thermoset, a CFRP, which is bounded or bonded by epoxy. So that was a problem. We could never uh, get anything to stick. Uh, and we tried copper and aluminum. Obviously, we tried copper because it's high conductivity and aluminum because it's light. So none of that worked. And so when we you have a quick look at erosion, uh, the first problem is velocity. And uh, clearly, uh, brittle materials are much more sensitive to velocity. So the idea was we can't use the usual velocities that we use, which are generally supersonic. And that led us to decide to use this thing called low pressure cold spray, which basically is a lowering of the velocities. And the other problem uh, was the erodent uh, hardness. 
And so copper and aluminum were presumably too hard. So that's why we went for tin. Uh, so we did that because tin's got a very low strength level, but also because other people had done it. So we just wanted to see whether it was doable. The other thing that uh, could affect hardness is gas temperature. So uh, you need, uh, it, despite the fact that it's called cold, you need a heated gas in order to get the velocities that you quite like. And so there's a temptation to think, well, if you go to higher gas temperatures, uh, you might reduce the hardness of the particle. But the problem here, especially with tin, is that it's prone to clog the, uh, the nozzle. So, th so that was a problem, and uh, we kind of got round that a little bit by doing this thing called downstream powder injection. So this is classic uh, feeding of the powder. So this is uh, the gas is stream is split into two. There's a powder feeder, and then the powder is fed before you reach the throat of the de Laval type nozzle. But there is another approach called downstream feeding, which is seen here. And so you're feeding the powder just after the nozzle, so your chances of clogging kind of reduce. They're not negligible, but they go down. Fortunately, uh, there's a company which does this, low pressure cold spray plus downstream injection. It's Centerline, and it turns out to be a Canadian company, so it's a kind of win-win situation. So we, uh, we did a cold spray with tin using these uh, parameters using nitrogen as a carrier gas. And uh, basically we successfully deposited tin. So here's uh, the results for uh, the uh, gas temperature. So this is the gas temperature of 300 degrees centigrade at a variety of pressures. Basically when you increase the pressure, you'll increase the velocity. And so uh, we got uh, images of the coating thickness at low mag and high mag. And uh, you can see that at the lowest, even at uh, 42 PSI, we're starting to get a coating. It's uh, not quite uh, regular. It's not very thick either. The other thing I'd like to point out is the interface between the coating and the substrate is kind of clean, if you like, not quite, quite smooth. If you increase just a little bit to 60 PSI, then you really get a very good uh, boost in uh, the thickness, which means you, you're around about the critical velocity. The other thing to notice is that you've roughened up the interface uh, between the uh, coating and the substrate. However, if you further increase the velocity, uh, the thickness isn't as good. In fact, it's way down. You've got more activity or roughness between the coating and the substrate. And finally, at this uh, quite high pressure, uh, it's a terrible mess. It's not as good as even the 42 PSI, and you've got a lot of damage at the interface, which suggests an erosion problem. Deposition efficiency follows suit, as you can imagine. And so out of a lot of this work, uh, we generated a rough idea of a process map uh, where we're looking at uh, gas temperature and gas pressure as the key process variables. So first off, at very high temperatures, you don't want to go there because you could probably clog the nozzle. Nobody likes that. And if you go too low at temperature, the particles generally are too hard. Uh, and so once you set those two boundaries, there's a couple of other boundaries in between these temperature levels. And uh, at this point, there's no coating. And that's because either the critical velocity hasn't been reached uh, because the gas pressures are kind of too low. And if you're at too low a temperature, you've got no velocity or you've got erosion. So even up here, when maybe the velocities are kind of okay, uh, erosion seems to be a problem. So you don't get any coating in this bit. And in the other side of the, uh, this uh, region, you've got no coating. And we think that's just because of uh, erosion and that is a velocity problem. So in between, you seem to have quite a lot of scope for coating, except that when you look at it more closely, there's a very limited region, which is towards the higher temperatures. 
uh, and towards the lower gas pressures where you actually get continuous coating and the rest of the time you got discontinuous coating so it's a bit limited but you can get a decent coating if we look again a bit more at the microstructure this is a little bit lower than 300 but it's at the optimum pressure uh, we notice this interesting effect on the top of the code thing we're seeing kind of satellites everywhere and if you do a cross section of the coating uh, you can see them more clearly and at this point it kind of looks like melting and if you look at the as received feedstock they're clean there aren't any satellites so this all happens during cold spray so we think a bit of melting is happening and so uh, Han Ching uh, devised this crack filling mechanism, which uh, needs <coughs> uh, melting. I think we need a little bit of melting. It says softening as well, but I think melting is important. And so once you get that, uh, there's still a solid core. So these particles hit the substrate, the solid core cracks the material because it's a brittle material. And because there's a little bit of liquid, uh, the cracks kind of fill up with the liquid and uh, maybe a bit of the solid soft material. And that's how you get adhesion onto the substrate uh, without erosion. And you can see signs of this uh, in this blow up here where you can see penetration into the substrate of uh, the coating. So uh, let's have a look, uh, further look at deposition efficiency. So this is at 60 PSI, and this is the effect of temperature. And uh, first thing to note is that the melting point of tin is at around about 220. Uh, so here we, we know we're getting melting. Uh, so obviously, because the residence time of the uh, particles and the gas is very quick, uh, you're not going to get melting at 220, you'll get melting at some higher temperature, and it seems to be around this temperature where I think you're going to get a little bit of melting, and that's why you get a rapid increase in the deposition efficiency. Um, however, if you look at uh, deposition efficiency at 300 uh, versus pressure, so now this is the effect of pressure at 300, the first thing you might ask yourself is, why are we looking at 300? Why don't we look higher? And so the answer, I remind you, is clogging. And we didn't even like to go above 300 because we were all worried about clogging. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this deposition efficiency is it looks good until you look at the numbers where 20%, it's not even reaching 20%, and that's not very good. That's a very low deposition efficiency. And we thought at the time this might be because the velocity is too low, and maybe if you increase the velocity, you might get more deposition. However, uh, if you look at this graph, you notice that as you increase the pressure, uh, the deposition efficiency decreases. This may well be due to erosion of something, uh, but it also means that if you increase the velocity, it's not a good idea. So uh, the rest of this was trying to figure out, is there a way to increase the deposition efficiency uh, without increasing the velocity? This is a cold sprayability equation, the usual one. Well, it's not the usual one. There's a couple of other ones. But this is uh, the classic from Asadi. And one of the parameters that affect uh, critical velocity is melting point. And uh, so the idea here is that if you lower the critical velocity, maybe you'll increase the deposition efficiency. So that's what we decided to do. And we did that by looking at low melting point tin alloys. Uh, we managed to get our hands on a tin zinc powder. And if you look at the tin zinc phase diagram, you notice there's a eutectic at around about 10% zinc or a little bit, bit more. And uh, with that, you can lower the melting point of the feedstock to 200 from 220. It's modest, but it's a decrease in temperature. Uh, we were also lucky enough to get hold of a tin bismuth alloy. And there you can really uh, get a decrease, a substantial decrease in temperature. Um, but you do have to add a lot of bismuth. It's around about 30 or 40 percent. But there you can knock it down to 138, which is not much more than the boiling point of water. 
which sounds good, or maybe it sounds bad, but anyway, it's there. So we did this. And so looking at uh, deposition efficiencies, this is for the pure tin. Uh, and we're looking at um, two temperatures. This is at 300 degrees C. And we're looking at two substrates, steel, which is a kind of reference, but you'll find out why we, you, we need to keep looking at steel deposition. It's a handy thing to uh, gauge the success of the uh, process. And the red uh, curve or the red points are, in this case, it's actually an ABS polymer. It's not a CFRP, but the, I would say the principles are kind of the same. So what you find, and uh, what you find at 200 is that you're not getting much deposition, uh, but uh, they follow the same behavior. So the difference between the steel and the ABS, we think it seems to be erosion again. Again, you got this problem of if you increase the velocity, then you start eroding something. Uh, but with 200 degrees centigrade, uh, the behavior of steel and ABS is the same, but it's not much. There's not much really happening because you're only reaching 10%. And maybe at 200, um, you're not, the velocity is too low for any erosion to take place. So you're just getting deposition, uh, even though uh, you're looking at ABS or the polymer. Uh, when you use uh, the tin zinc, uh, in fact, uh, the curves look very similar. And uh, the only thing uh, that's worth mentioning, I think, is when you look at uh, what's happening at 40 PSI, and we notice that uh, both the ABS and the steel have got kind of increased deposition efficiency uh, compared to the pure tin. So it does seem like the tin zinc does something, uh, but unfortunately we can't capitalize on this with the polymer because again, you get erosion, uh, but in this case, 40 PSI. The tin bismuth is spectacularly different. Firstly, note that this axis has gone from being uh, 0 to 50% to 0 to 100%, which means that we're getting uh, prepared to get a lot more deposition. Uh, at 200, again, not a lot's going on, so we don't worry about that. But at 300, uh, there's a spectacular increase in ductility, uh, in deposition efficiency. So uh, the, obviously the red is still the polymer and uh, the steel even has got very high deposition efficiencies. But the interesting thing, the other interesting thing here is that when you increase uh, the pressure, uh, both of the um, deposition efficiencies drop in the same way, which sort of suggests that there might be some sort of uh, difference in the deposition mechanism compared to uh, the previous examples. And if we look at the coding cross sections at 300, uh, we can see that in tin, you can kind of see that uh, the, I, I would say, the powder particles are kind of delineated. Uh, whereas with uh, the tin bismuth, if you look a bit closer, you can't see any delineation of the boundaries. Uh, the other thing that's worth noting is that at the interface, it's very rough, whereas at the interface here, it's very smooth. So we suspect that the tin bismuth just melt, melted totally. And so you're kind of looking more like a thermal spray kind of deposition mechanism versus a cold spray type dep de uh, deposition mechanism. The other thing that we tried to do was mix metal powders. I think people have played around with add additions of secondary components, and they do seem they can improve deposition efficiency. Uh, so um, we looked at uh, what we regard as the main parameters that could control this, which are density, hardness, morphology, and particle size. And by using this kind of range or variety of secondary components, so uh, from pure aluminum and pure copper and pure titanium to alloys of aluminum, uh, pure iron, stainless steel, we were able to vary density over this range, hardness quite considerably, morphology was either spherical or irregular, and particle size had a quite, a quite good range too. Uh, unfortunately, when we looked at the effect of these parameters, 
Uh, they didn't really have a systematic effect. I think the, this is density, this is morphology factor, this is particle size uh, uh, plotted against deposition efficiency. So you don't see any real patterns going on here, and you don't really see any massive improvement. So here you can see 25% is about as good as it gets by all of these variations. The only thing that really looked systematic was hardness. And so when we take a closer look at the effect of hardness, it's still a bit chaotic. But we can see uh, that um, at the lower hardnesses, you're tending to get um, increases. Uh, whereas when you go to higher hardnesses, you def definitely get decreases. And so the general idea was that uh, if the hardness of the secondary component was kind of close to the substrate, then here you might enhance the crack mechanism without actually causing a lot of erosion. So that was the general idea about uh, in this particular study of uh, secondary components to try to improve deposition efficiency. Well, that's uh, CFRP with epoxy. So uh, we, I think I'm not, I don't recall uh, the previous speaker saying anything, but I do hear that uh, some of the aerospace companies are quite keen on thermoplastics being the, uh, the bonding agent for CFRP. And, and that's because um, they seem to fulfill a lot of uh, good characteristics. They're generally better in a lot of ways than uh, epoxies or thermosets. The only problem is they're more expensive, and that's why epoxies uh, are used in aircraft. But, uh, I mean, there's a possibility uh, that thermoplastics can be coming into the picture. So we decided to have a quick look at the effect of cold spraying on other polymers, but not reinforced with carbon fiber, just the polymer itself. So uh, we had a look at thermo, these thermoplastics, ABS, PEAK, and PEI. I think they're quite, quite common. Possibly they're in the mix. And uh, the main thing that we were looking at was a variation in the glass transition temperature, because the general idea is that uh, the softening would help uh, avoid erosion. That was the general idea. The other thing to notice is that uh, the mechanical properties tend to follow uh, the glass transition temperature. It's not a hard and fast rule, but they do here. So hardness and tensile strength uh, with ABS uh, were lowest because uh, it has the lowest glass transition temperature. And ductility tended to be best uh, because there's this rough inverse relationship between strength and ductility. So bearing all that in mind, uh, we uh, threw uh, three types of metal powders at these substrates, uh, copper, tin, and iron with these characteristics. Uh, the main thing to notice is that um, iron is very hard, a copper less so, and tin, as we know, is very soft. And in terms of the velocities, uh, the interesting thing here is that we were now also using high pressure. And the other thing to notice is that um, you can get kind of, we were getting quite, uh, I would say, rapid changes in velocity when we varied pressure at low pressures, but with high pressures, it's a very modest increase in velocity. So that's uh, for tin and copper. And uh, note that the critical velocity for copper is around about there, and the critical velocity for tin is there, which means, roughly speaking, that we're not expecting to get a buildup of a copper layer if you don't go to high pressure, basically. But for tin, anything will do. Any, theoretically, you'll get a buildup uh, with any uh, pressure that you're using or any velocity that we're using here. And similarly here for iron, uh, so uh, again, you've got two different uh, um, low pressure and high pressure responses. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing here is that the estimation of the critical velocity for iron is uh, actually above any of the velocities we were using. So the thought was maybe we're never going to get any deposition of iron anywhere. 
So if we look at tin, and th this is at 200, so now we're not doing this melting thing. It's solid because we're thinking, let's do classic cold spray. Uh, so uh, we uh, included CFRP. We know things about it in steel, again, as this kind of reference thing. And these are the pressures that we used. So at low pressures, not much happening, but at least it's positive. Uh, suddenly, the next pressure, you're starting to get deposition of ABS and the steel, so that's good. And then uh, you start getting more and more deposition as you increase pressure, so that's excellent. Uh, however, nothing much happens at the next pressure, and so we think uh, that maybe some erosion is happening. Uh, here we can see that uh, this is what happens at peak for the coating. This is the ABS. It's very wavy, so we think there's a lot of erosion going on. With iron, you're really not getting any deposition at all. Even the steel's having problems. And where you are getting deposition, you've got kind of embedding. And iron at 425 is just really the same thing. But copper is the interesting thing because you start getting some embedding of the copper, which gives you a, a positive deposition. And steel is obviously starting to get coating, so you've reached the critical velocity. Uh, so you still only have embedding of the uh, copper, but then afterwards you get quite a lot of deposition of copper in the peak and the PI, but not in the ABS. And in fact, uh, the coatings kind of look good, but ABS uh, gets worse, so you're getting a lot more erosion of ABS, even though the glass transition temperature has been is very low. So you have to watch out for mechanical properties of the ABS. It's not just about um, uh, the glass transition temperature. So this gives us an idea of thinking about how to spray uh, polymers. So the first thing to think about is that you've got to establish a metal layer onto the substrate. So you look at uh, things to do with uh, coating onto the polymer substrate. And then after that, there's a buildup of the metal on metal. So if we look at uh, the velocity of the first layer, then this is the um, critical velocity for metal deposition. And this is the erosion velocity. So the idea is that if we straddle uh, those uh, regions, then we'll have a coating window. But for everything else, uh, we don't get that straddling, so we don't get coatings. And basically, you can simplify this by simply saying that if the critical velocity for metal on metal is lower than the erosion velocity for the polymer, then you'll get a coating. And if it isn't, you'll never get a coating. So that's it. I can conclude by uh, thermoplastics generally being better to cold spray than thermosets, probably because of TG. Uh, but you've got to watch out for mechanical properties. And if you consider the coating as a two step process, you need the critical velocity of the metal to be always lower than the critical velocity of the substrate erosion. So that's it. Thanks very much.